pleased to welcome Jim Knight, who is an authority on the study of learning and teaching and coaching. He is the director of the Kansas Coaching Project at the University of Kansas Center for Research on Learning and the president of the International, excuse me, Instructional Coaching Group. Uh, he's published widely in a variety of journals, and his most recent book is focused on teaching using video for high impact instruction, uh, which if my teaching evaluations are any indication would be a good idea, and, and students want to see more video and less of me, it seems, so I should probably read this book. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Sarah, I don't think we've met before, so I just want to say how grateful I am um, and let you know that I'm, like everybody here, extremely busy. And the reason I came is because I'm profoundly grateful to the team I work with at Corwin. Elisa's here representing the team. I saw Dave here. Um, uh, there's Dave down there. Um, I'm not easy, an easy person to trust, but I trust those people. And I've come to really trust the group, and I'm, I'm grateful for them. I want to tell you a story. It has uh, three characters, and the title is Invisible Children. Um, first character is a 12-year-old girl, Diana. I've changed her name. Uh, I tell this story in a book called High Impact Instruction. Uh, Diana was a girl from Mexico, and her family moved to Beaverton, Oregon. And she went to school not knowing very much English. And when she got to school, uh, she realized it was going to be a bit of a challenge. I think sometimes we underestimate what it must be like for a 12-year-old in a middle school to go to a, a classroom not knowing the language. I know I was asked when I was, an under, when I was a graduate student to present uh, in Japan for my uh, dissertation advisor. And I remember the experience of not really being able to speak up and say what I wanted and not really understanding the culture was unsettling for me a uh, university student who is an adult, I can only imagine what it would be like for, in this case, a very shy 12-year-old in a school that was, and middle school is especially complex emotional place. And uh, Diana was a pretty introverted child. She had this beautiful long hair, though, that was kind of a distinguishing characteristic for her. But unfortunately, her story gets a little worse. Um, what happened was her family got lice, which happens in schools and um, sometimes, and her father got so frustrated um, that he shaved her head, and she had to go to school with this hoodie on. I could only imagine what it must be like to be 12 years old, wake up in the morning, look in the mirror as you brush your teeth, see all your hair gone, which was kind of like your defining characteristic as a beautiful thing. And so uh, what she would do is she would wear this hoodie, and in the school they had a policy that you couldn't wear hoodies, but for, for this girl I'm calling Diana, they. They ignored the policy. And what she tried to do is she tried to be invisible. Uh, she did everything she could to not be noticed. She was shy. She was quiet. And, um, and she was likely to drop out. Uh, there are lots of different ways of analyzing the number of students in America who drop out. But I think if you were to average them all together, you'd end up around somewhere like 25% of students don't graduate. That's one every 26 seconds. See, I've got numbers and a story. Um, <laughs> And the cost of dropouts, like Diana, where she did drop out, NPR did a program a few years back, which is still online and which is really worth looking at. They estimated that the cost of dropouts annually in the United States is 325 to 350 billion. When you calculate things like incarceration, health care, social benefits, um, lost tax revenue. And she's one of those kids. Now, Diana's teacher is the second hero in the story, uh, Sarah Langton. A uh, wonderful teacher and science teacher in um, Beaverton, Oregon, in the school district. And Sarah, I've uh, seen on video many times in interviews and uh, watched her in workshops. And she's, like so many teachers, deeply committed. For her, it's an act of social justice to teach. And she really cares deeply about her students. And when I watched her in interviews, she said um, how much it mattered to her. And, I want to talk about the complexity of being a teacher is the second part of this story. Now, there's a great uh, little article you can find online, Glauberman and Zimmerman, two researchers from Toronto, one from York and one from the University of Toronto, and they, they study the complexity of healthcare, but I think their ideas apply in other settings. I first ran into the book in Atul Gawande, or the article in Atul Gawande's Checklist Manifesto. They said there are different kinds of tasks, 
And I think this is extremely important if you're involved in policy to understand these distinctions. One kind of task is a simple task. Uh, baking a cake, they say, is their example of a simple task. It's not for me, but for most people, baking a cake is a simple task. You follow the recipe, you get a cake. The second kind of task is a complicated task. A complicated task is one that involves an awful lot, but once you resolve it, you can keep doing it over and over again. So for example, putting a person on the moon is a complicated task. Once you've done it, you can keep doing it. You've solved the problem, same things over and over again, you should get the same solutions. That's a complicated task. A complex task is teaching a classroom of students like Diana. Because it changes all the time, because a recipe won't solve the problem. Ron Heifetz at Harvard talked about different kinds of challenges leaders face in organizations. He says there are technical challenges and there are adaptive challenges. Technical challenges address simple tasks and complicated tasks. But adaptive challenges require adaptive results. And the single largest mistake leaders can make, he says, is to take an adaptive or a technical solution and apply it to an adaptive challenge. If you try to put a recipe as a solution to the complexities of the classroom, he would say that's the worst leadership make a mistake you can make. So that's our second character, Sarah. The third character is Michelle Harris, who told me this interview and who welled up in tears as she told me this story as I interviewed him for the, for the book High Impact Instruction. Michelle is an instructional coach. She's worked with me for many years. And um, she's a voracious learner. I mean, she is relentlessly pursuing new ideas. And so she's a perfect coach, a person who is shoulder to shoulder, a second set of eyes, a person who works with the, the, the teachers. And um, Sarah had learned a few things about work, what work involved. One of the things is people aren't motivated by other people's goals. We look at the work of DC and Ryan in particular, but lots of people who look at motivation. We're, you know, my, my wife Jenny is here, and she said, Jim, I have got a great goal for you. You should go on this diet. Let's go. If she gave me the diet, it's not going to be nearly as motivating if I choose it for myself. And there's endless, sufficient evidence to say, as uh, the old saying goes, um, if you, <laughs> when you insist, I will resist that people need to have a voice in what they do. And we had studied this. It was a big part of our training with, with, um, with our coach. Now, I should just tell you one more little tidbit here. Shane Lopez is a researcher at the University of Kansas, one of my colleagues. And he works primarily for the Gallup organization. He looked at a, a surveys, over 100,000 surveys, to analyze a critical variable in whether or not you like your work, which is, does your voice matter at work? They analyzed the data from truck drivers, uh, service workers in restaurants, doctors, architects. And he sat down with me in this little restaurant in Lawrence and he said, Jim, guess who came at the bottom of the list below service workers, below truck drivers? Teachers. In that survey of 100,000 people, teachers felt their voice counted the least. And there's ample evidence that for professionals, having a voice matters. Um, Thomas, Davenport book, Thomas Davenport's book, The Knowledge uh, people who think for a living. He says, the defining characteristic of a knowledge worker is to want to have a voice, to be involved, to have autonomy. So um, Diana was the student. Sarah was the teacher. Michelle was the coach. And so Sarah came to Michelle and she said, I'm really busy, uh, but I really need your help. I have a new curriculum and I'd really like to work with you. And so Michelle said, well, let's do it. And she started, and we have de developed using design research over a period of time, a simple process that's adaptive and that positions the teacher as the decision maker, but nonetheless is accountable in the sense that it begins with a clear picture of current reality and leads to unmistakably positive improvements. And so what Michelle said is, why don't I come and I'll video record your class? And she video recorded the class. She loaded it onto uh, the teacher's uh, computer. And um, Sarah sat down and watched the video. And it happened to be the class Diana was in. And Michelle and her got together. And Michelle said, so what did you see watching the video? And she'd given her some tools to kind of analyze the video of her lesson. She said, Diana is not the only student trying to be invisible in that class. There are seven other students in that class learning English. And none of them answered a single question. And I never realized it until I watched the video. And so they decided that they'd set a goal. And it's critical, I think, in change to have a very clearly articulated goal. 
And their goal was that at least 70% of the time, all students would participate. Diana couldn't be invisible. She had to be an active participant. And uh, Michelle knows a lot of effective practices and instruction. She has what I call an instructional playbook, a set of high leverage, easy to understand, powerful practices that can make a difference. And she said, let's try uh, talking tokens. And talking tokens is a simple thing. You give every student three tokens. When it's their turn to talk, they, they put it out there in the middle of the table. And uh, that way, you can make sure everybody talks a couple of times. That was the simple idea. And uh, she explained it clearly, probably with a checklist, and made sure she understood it. And then they taught the practice to students. And they sat back, excited to see the, what the results were. So what do you suppose happened? Well, what they had for tokens were dominoes. Uh, some previous teacher had left hundreds of dominoes in the classroom. And so every kid got three dominoes. Now, do any of you have 14, 13 or 12-year-old kids at home? What would happen if they had a stack of dominoes in front of them? They played dominoes. It had no impact. In fact, it was, it was damaging to learning in the classroom. So they went, got back together, and they said, well, that didn't work. What can we do next? And they said, well, let's try Think, Pair, Share. Think, Pair, Share, where you pair kids up. And they thought really carefully about what students would be paired with which students. Diana was paired with a friend of hers, highly proficient in English, that she was comfortable talking with. And every highly proficient student was paired up with a kid who was struggling with, with English. And it turned out the problem was they didn't know the content. The problem was they weren't comfortable saying it. Diana was about three grade levels below reading by the end of the year. She was almost at grade level, according to my interview with Michelle. And I have a video of um, Michelle and Sarah talking where Sarah, the teacher, turned to Michelle and she said, what does it mean that these students can do this now, that they know they can learn? Well, everybody has their own interpretations of stories, but what it means to me is this. First off, if we want teachers to be professionals, if we want professionals to teach our children, then we shouldn't treat them like skilled laborers. We should treat them like professionals, which means we give them a large element of uh, autonomy. Autonomy in a process that has really clear processes to lead to real clear changes. But without autonomy, it's likely not going to happen. I don't get excited when other people tell me what to do all the time if I'm a professional. Years of experience, a degree, multiple degrees possibly. Second thing is technical solutions don't solve adopt adaptive, <laughs> adaptive problems. We can't come up with a recipe, as um, one author said. It, in education, it's never one size fits all, it's one size fits one. And we need to come up with processes that lead to unmistakable improvements, adaptive processes, and ours is instructional coaching, that have a really clear pathway, uh, but that, that also respond to, to the situation. This bottle's getting me. Um, and what if the whole school decided everybody will use talking tokens? And that was their solution. They came up with a kind of recipe solution. Well, what would have happened is it wouldn't have made any difference. It would have made things worse in her class. It wouldn't have solved the big problem. And the last thing is a basic thing, which is that better teaching equals better learning, and that's, that's good for all of us. And I think if we strive for finding ways to position teachers as professionals, and we give them simple processes that are accountable, and we allow for them to use their brains to solve their solutions, it, it can truly be better for all of us. So thank you.